All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Psalm Sense. I'm your host, Rachel K. Ng, and here we have um, Varanis, our special star guest today, here to talk with us about all things olfactive, especially perfume and cologne. Welcome. Hi, Derek. How are you today? Hello. It me. So why don't we start out with it? What are you wearing today? Uh, well, today I am wearing Balenciaga Hohang, but I'm not wearing it under the name that most people would be familiar with. I do own bottles of Balenciaga Hohang that is labeled as such, but this particular bottle has a bit of a story behind it. So um, to make a short, short work of this, I don't want to make this a long thing, but um, Hohang was originally released in 1972 when Balenciaga, the perfume Balenciaga was owned by Marbear because Cristobal Balenciaga sold everything to Marbear when he retired and then he passed away in 72. He actually passed away the same year this came out. This came out in 72. Uh, and then once uh, Jacques uh, Conquier, uh, is it C-O-N? Yeah, Conquier. Jacques Conquier then bought Balenciaga from Marbear and Jacques Conquier is the owner of uh, Bogart, Bogart Group. So Jacques Bogart, for those who are familiar with that brand. So under the Bogart ownership, Balenciaga saw Hohang relaunched. And it went from the old packaging that some folks know with the clear orange cap to the same bottle, but with a solid red cap and a red band around the uh, middle of the bottle. That's called second vintage. Uh, during that second vintage relaunch, Hohang got a worldwide release. It was originally just Europe, North America, etc., uh, that second relaunch, it was launched everywhere. So we're talking the Middle East, we're talking Asia, parts of Asia, Japan. And the name Hohang means good luck in some dialects uh, over in Asia. But in other dialects, it can have a very not appropriate meaning, a slang meaning. So they relabeled Hohang uh, for the Asian market and the Middle East market because that, that was one market for them. They renamed it as Club, Balenciaga Club. So this is actually Hohan, but it says club. Oh, cool. And like I said, I own bottles of Hohan that are of this form factor with this label, and they say Hohan. And I've done many A-B tests. It is the same fragrance. Some of the really uh, dug-in vintage guys, you know, what I call the gatekeepers, will argue me that they're different. They'll say, oh, no, it smells different. I bought it. And then my, my answer to that, and you're the wine person, so you know all about this. My answer to that is uh, Hohang is a very old fragrance. It's been discontinued for a very long time. There are probably very few pristine bottles of it left. And the chances are any differences you smell between bottles is not because one is named one thing and one is named the other. The differences you're smelling are just uh, continued maturation of the fragrance, you know, top notes fade, et cetera, because... I actually own one Hohang bottle that's perfect, as perfect as it can be. And I own two claw bottles. And those two claw bottles, I've sprayed both of them, they smell a little different from each other in terms of the top notes. And then also a little different from the Hohang. But they all dry down. Within five minutes, they all start smelling exactly the same. So, I mean, that, and I've done my research, so I know it's, it's the same fragrance. So yeah, that's that's my bottle of, uh, you know, uh, no name Hohang, I guess, right? My my AliExpress Wish dot com. <laughs> that's awesome, and I think you bring up something really important, um, and that's the idea. And this is something else that that both wine and fragrance have in common, and that's how important storage is, right? Because you actually should store ideally fragrance in the same conditions that you would store a bottle of wine, which would be out of direct sunlight, ideally in a cool like in a cool um, area like that doesn't have a lot of temperature fluctuations right yeah. um that's a little bit humid um so like a wine cooler is actually a great place to store fragrances if you have a little bit of you know fun money to invest in a small if you have a if you have a collection of fragrances lots of people just have one bottle which is great um but if you're if you if you do have a little bit of an investment in a fragrance collection and you're worried about um, just like uh, what you're saying, Derek, um, about how your bottles will age, because obviously if you have more than one, you want them to last and, and stay pristine or as pristine as possible um, in the age, during the aging process. Um, 
So yeah, that's really that's really interesting. Um, do you mind if I ask for just those of those people who haven't ever um, tried um, ho hang before? What does it smell like? Um, well, ho hang, ho hung. I'm not sure which one it is, but I guess it's that's a potato potato scenario there. But uh, ho hang, uh, it is a fougere. It was composed by Jacques Jensen and uh, Raymond, and I'm probably going to butcher this last name here, but C H A I L L A N Sh uh, Shylon. Shylon? Yeah, Shylon sounds good to me. Yeah. yeah so Raymond Shylon, who is a pretty well-known perfumer, by the way, he's done a lot of, of famous fragrances, especially in the seventies and the eighties and a bit of the nineties. That was his, his career arc. Mostly he, uh, on the men's side of things, cause that's where I specialize. He did uh, Yves Saint Laurent pour him the same year, actually, as this, in 72. Then he also has done uh, Boucheron pour him, which is 1990. But Raymond Shylon and Jacques Jensen composed uh, Hohan, and it was originally marketed unisex since in that uh, late 60s into the mid-70s, there was a bit of a, I wouldn't say a unisex fragrance craze so much, as I would say, a shared fragrance craze because we're talking free love, counterculture, in Monterey Pop, Woodstock. So a lot of that generation, you know, basically baby boomers when they were hitting their teens or 20s, uh, you know, before a lot of those cats went far right, you know, they were still very left. <laughs> they were yeah. taking LSD and all that good stuff. Wish they were still there, honestly, personally, in my opinion, but a lot of them are. But uh, they were really into sharing stuff, you know. And, um, you know, this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm going to try and keep it brief. A lot of that started because through a lot of the music, especially like the Beatles and other influences, they were getting into like Far East culture. So we're talking like Buddhism, stuff like that. And of course, the fragrances associated with that, especially like in India, where a lot of the fragrances don't have gender, the oils are just oils, right? Yeah. So. They were experimenting with Egyptian musk, with Mysore sandalwood oil, stuff like that. So they got used to just sharing everything. So the designers saw a potential market to create designer shared fragrances. And they just weren't really good at figuring out how to make that work in a designer alcohol fragrance context. So beyond like the Jovan Musks and stuff and the Alyssa Ashleys, they were successful, but beyond them like a lot of these brands uh balenciaga wasn't alone you had uh, eau de lancome you had eau de a lot of eau fragrances were the the shared fragrances eau de guerlain eau de patou eau de rochas eau with an actual eau eau de lancome if there's a pun in there somewhere um ysl had eau libre which is spelled eao libre so water i guess uh liberty water and then balenciaga had had ho -hum. and it was a fougere but i'm guessing it was trying to be a unisex fougere because it has a very green herbal side like you'd expect for a fougere for a man but then it gets really powdery and floral in the heart there's the lavender like you'd expect the geranium and all that good stuff but there's a very pronounced uh iris note in here not like makeup lipstick like more of an auris kind of uh you know yeah. Shalimar, Shalimar, kind of a kind of an iris note. And uh, for those of you who know really old fragrances, it's very similar to another unisex or at least non-gendered mm -hmm. fougere made about thirty years earlier called Arome Toi by Parfum d'Orsay. So Arome Toi is kind of the uh, the granddaddy of Ho Hong in a sense. Uh, I prefer Ho Hong though. I think it's a little bit more a uh, little more well put together, honestly. But so that's it. And it was sold like that for a couple of years. The advertisements, if you look them up, all reflect that shared nature, women and men together on the same uh, same ad. I guess they were, you know, smooching it out or whatever. And then eventually, I think men ended up buying it more. So the later ads into the 80s marketed more as a, a man's fragrance. And then there was aftershave and bar soap. And, you know, so it goes. Absolutely. And that 
is fascinating. I didn't know any of that history. And this is one reason why I adore your content and the things you put out. And in the show notes, you're going to see where you can um, find Varanis's work on YouTube and Instagram. I recommend everyone check out his YouTube videos. Um, they're fantastic. I learned so much. And this is why one reason why, why um, you will be joining me regularly as a guest to really um, bring that amazing knowledge and history. Um, and what you were saying just reminded me, like, for example, of, you know, the history of, of Jiki, right? Jiki, which kind of has that both masculine and feminine history. And then also, interestingly enough, I know today we're, we're going to talk a little bit because it's summertime now about Eau de Cologne. And for me, in a contemporary sense, I find Eau de Cologne's very unisex. Like I know a lot of people think of them as purely masculine, but I, oh. I own tons of Eau de Cologne's. I mean, it's, 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 they're bright, they're citrus, they're perfect, they're light and perfect for summer. Uh, but I'm curious what you think about that, about colognes. Um, are they unisex? Are they, are they masculine? What do you think about, about colognes? Well, if you follow the original, uh, um, if you follow the, the if, if you follow the origins of Eau de Cologne, you'll come to find out. And this is a, a thing I touched upon really with my perfume gender video, was that fragrances were originally not gendered because it didn't really matter since they were not something that common people had access to anyway. So fragrances were more of a status expression than a gender expression. You smelled perfume in the air. You didn't go, oh, here comes a girl. You thought, oh, here comes somebody with money. So perfume gender only came into question once perfume became democratized enough that enough guys, and it always starts with men, or we can always blame men, right? It's always, <laughs> men, it's always men's fault. But it's true, though. Enough guys began to wear the fragrances that were also being worn by women. And the guys were the first one to say, hey, I don't want to smell like something that my sister wears or my, my wife wears or whatever. I need my own thing because, you know, I'm a he man, masculine, manly man, you know, men in tights, men in tights. So the perfumers had to kind of uh, wing it for a bit. And a lot of the early fragrances that were pitched to men, they still weren't quite officially gendered. They were just like thematically masculine. Hmm. Like, for example, uh, Mouchoir de Monsieur is a famous adaptation. Is a famous uh, yeah adaptation of Jiki. I pronounced Monsieur. It's Monsieur. Sorry, but uh, it's a tongue twister of a word anyway. Yeah, Mouchoir de Monsieur. That's kind of like blah, 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 blah. Well, the French. entire French language is a tongue twister. <laughs> yeah, but Mouchoir de Monsieur was a uh, a masculine adaptation of Jiki because mm -hmm. enough guys and women were wearing Jiki that the guys were going. Hey, wait a minute, right? So Jacques Guerlain decided originally he made it for his friend who was getting married since his friend's wife wore Jiki, but he also liked it. So making MDM for short was the way of getting around that. But then after it being a boutique exclusive through the first half of the 20th century, into the 50s, Guerlain finally decided to bottle it and sell it. Originally, it was a if you know, you know kind of a deal where you come in buy an empty Lalique bottle or something and then get it filled with the Mouchoir de Monsieur. I had to ask for it. So, but anyhow, getting back to Eau de Cologne, this is all related, I promise. So the original Eau de Colognes were the first real attempt to democratize fragrance. You know, you had um, Eau de Hungary before that, but Eau de Hungary was a recipe. So it was something you made, you know. People who wore Eau de Hungary in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, they were people that had gardens. They were alchemists, early alchemists, mm -hmm. druggists, whatever. They knew how to make the stuff. You bought it from like candle makers, places like that. And it was made pretty much there on premises. But the Cologne, on the other hand, was created originally by Johann Marie Farina when he moved from Italy to Germany. He settled in Köln, which is the German word for Cologne. And he created this fragrance for everyone in the town to use because it was his way of saying, thank you for letting me stay here because I'm a foreigner. You know, you think immigration is bad now? <laughs> you think immigration in like the 16, the, 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 the 16, 1700s, immigration was, you know, we will put a, a, you know, we'll put a freaking spear through you if you don't belong here. That's <laughs> how it was. So for not being tarred and feathered or, or hung out in the town square, you know, in the stockade or whatever, his thank you was, okay, here's, here's this nice, smelly water. And it was really 
a, a hygiene preparation too, because it was very high alcohol content. I think it's somewhere like 80% alcohol. So it was meant to be used not just as fragrance, but as a way of uh, if you didn't want to spend all day drawing a bath and heating up a bathtub because they didn't have running water back then, you could just take a sponge or something or a rag, just kind of sponge bath yourself in the cologne and it was alcohol. So it helped clean your skin and, you know, you didn't reek. And that's where, that's where cologne was for a long time, you know, before it became a fragrance in and of itself, it was more of a utility item. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was always shared. And the only reason why I think men ended up taking the cologne and a lot of men's fragrances were then labeled as cologne is because men had still that pragmatic, um, practical idea. They didn't want to use a smell that was just a smell. It had to have purpose. Mm. After Macassar, you get my you get my point. Some yeah. kind of function. So for them, yeah. function. So that's why they wanted to use cologne. Women were more into the the X rays and the parfums and whatnot. So that's my take on cologne. It was never unisex by design. It was never gendered by design. So it still really shouldn't be gendered. Absolutely. And it's such a fascinating history. And that's something that like from a from a uh, olfactive and especially from a um, wine point of view or uh, wine and and, you know, all kinds of, of spirits. Um, there's that really interesting period of time wh where you were talking about alchemy and alchemists where yeah. like, you know, medicine, um, a beverage, um, health care. Um, smelling good, cleanliness, all of those, all of those were kind of all intertwined. They weren't really separated out. They weren't really regulated like they are today. And so yeah. you could have something like, for example, the drink, the beverage chartreuse, which is like a liqueur that was, that had the same function as an eau de cologne, right? And that was made specifically by the Cartesian um, monks, right? And that was a bunch of herbs and citrus peels and stuff that were all, but mostly herbs that were uh, like fort put in fortified alcohol, but it was a cleansing and, and and it was a cleansing water and it was considered medicine so you could take it and spray it in the air to make you know to get rid of the bad the bad airs the, the miasma the bad vapors to cleanse your air you can rub it on your skin to you know help your help your skin help you be healthy you can drink it right again for general health and also to, to smell good right because the the theory of health back then was so interesting is that um diseases were usually uh, transform or transported through the air, through miasma, through bad air. And so anything that you could do to make your air and your surroundings smell good was actually practicing healthcare. Um, one thing about cologne that I didn't mention was that the original ones, at least the original formulas of the original ones, so uh, the original Farina cologne, and of course the ones that followed was they were made from potable alcohol <clears throat> because they didn't really have the uh, I guess didn't have the technology to create like non-potable, like an SD alcohol, you know? So everything was made from some form of potable, mm -hmm. I guess, ethanol, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> as a side effect of that, one of the things they recommended you could do with eau de cologne was you could mouthwash, you could <laughs> it. It was uh, a cure-all. I mean, it really had no scientific backing as being a cure-all, but it was presented as a cure-all. You could drink it for good health. You could, switch it between your teeth or whatever to clean your teeth. And one of the names for it was aqua mirabilis or miracle water. And uh, you mentioned the whole monks thing. Well, it's funny because one of the marketing angles for the original eau de colognes, which back then being that it was Germany, they were called, uh, I'm probably going to butcher this too, but they were echt, uh, they, they are echt konisch Wasser, echt konisch Wasser or the water of Cologne. So, or oh, the cool. water. So echt Echt Konisch Wasser then got translated into Eng uh, to French as Eau de Cologne. Uh, it still says Echt Konisch Wasser on the 4711 bottles if you buy them. It'll say so up top in the German. Uh, so, yeah, people bought that and they just kind of used it for everything. You know, it was like a drink it, shower with it, or whatever, sponge down with it, switch between my teeth, bring yeah. my bed with it, you know, whatever, wash my clothes in it, makes it smell good. So, it's kind of yeah. silly. That's also why the bottles were so huge because you went through a lot of it, you know. And Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm pretty sure I read somewhere that the 4711 that 
the reason it's called 4711 was that was the address of the original Cologne store in Cologne, Germany. And that's that's the reason why the brand has that name. That's what I, I read somewhere. And I'm not sure if that's I didn't like research it, but I, I I've heard that. OK, so the story behind 4711 specifically is kind of fun, too. I'll try to I'll try to be short on this as well. I don't want to like monopolize this uh, this uh, stream here. But so um, 4711 was originally created by Wilhelm Mullins, which the company uh, Mullins would, would be named after. And now they're Mara and Works. They're merged with Mara and Works. But Wilhelm Mullins, he basically looked at Johann Marie Farina and he went, OK, well, I'm going to do a Pepsi to your Coke. I'm going to make your product cheaper because originally Pepsi, people don't remember, Pepsi was actually double the quantity for the same price as Coke. Pepsi's original uh, point of sale was you get more for your money. So it was cheaper. So he kind of pulled one of those in the 1700s on Farina where he went and I guess they didn't have gas chromatography back then. So I'm guessing he just smelled and said, okay, well, I think there's this, I think there's that just kind of approximated it. But he developed a cologne formula and then originally he marketed it as Farina Eau de Cologne and sold it as Farina Eau de Cologne. <laughs> In direct competition with the real Farina, mm -hmm. which had its own little red logo and stuff. So what happened was they didn't they didn't have patents back then. They didn't have copyrights back then. So this set some legal precedent actually for that time period, 18th century. So uh, Yo Joseph uh, yeah Johann Marie Farina actually took Wilhelm Mullins to court for this uh, and. So what uh, uh, Wilhelm Mullins tried to do was find a member of the Farina family, extended family, cousins or whatever, and say, hey, yeah, okay, so this guy is signing off on me using the last name. So it doesn't matter what you say. He's, he's part of the business. And the judge was like, no, uh-uh, no, you can't, you can't do that. So even though there was no real copyright law at the time, it was a sort of an arbitrary decision by the judge, but he – he ruled in Johann's favor, thus that forced Wilhelm Mullins to rename his uh, version of Cologne from Farina to something else. So at the time, his home address was 4711. So he just went, okay, formula number 4711. That's what we're going to call it. And then later on, built the factory in Glock the Glockengast factory, which still exists, by the way. Built the factory in, in, in Cologne, but... Uh, you know, the address is actually was his old house. Oh, that's so, fascinating. That's how it became 4711. And the whole thing was you got bigger bottles for less money. So ultimately, 4711 kind of won mm -hmm. because people ended up buying that. Farina remained more of a luxury, more of like an upper crusty. The aristocrats used the Farina. Actually, uh, Napoleon for a long time used Farina until he had his own cologne made by Guerlain. There's a little segue there. You know, Pierre Pascal Guerlain created Napoleon, uh, his own imperial, his, uh, you know, Cologne du Imperial, created Napoleon his own cologne to use. But before that, Napoleon was kind of buying up every bottle of Farina he could get and running running the stock out of the freaking, uh, the poor guy. So everyone else was using 4711, I guess, because it's what they could get their hands on. Yeah, anyway. and that... Yeah, that's so fascinating. I was just reading this amazing book called a book called Elixir um, mm -hmm. that I really recommend to everyone. I'll put it in the show notes. But there's a really interesting kind of small section about Napoleon and his cologne use, which was wild. I mean, the guy used like 15 bottles a day or something insane because he oh, really be he really believed, and, and like uh, many people did, that 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 this was the the cutting edge medical technology of the day with this uh, eau de cologne. And so he believed that for every, I think it was something like every hour, what he would do is he would have a, a hot bath drawn and he would sit in the hot bath and he'd pour a whole bottle of cologne in the bath and he'd keep having the bath refilled with steaming hot water. So, so the steam and the vapors would rise and he called it his rejuvenation. And he believed for every hour he spent in the bath, it would, that would replace like an hour of sleep. 
So he would sleep for very few hours, but then spend many working hours. Like he'd be in there conducting, be naked in the bath, conducting business with his, you know, ministers and his secretaries, et cetera, would just come in there in his bathroom and he'd be doing business. But he genuinely believed that it was rehab, it was, um, it was giving him energy and vitality and health and all of this stuff. And then he didn't need to sleep much because of this eau de cologne. So he just went through bottles and bottles every day. It's fascinating. Really? He had his version of Red Bull, right? It gave him wings. So <laughs> totally. I, mean, I, I, I know. I know. Back then, they uh, didn't have powdered cocaine yet, but back <laughs> then they would chew on they would chew on coca leaves back then. So oh, probably, I wonder. They chewed on some coca leaves too, or else you can't just go for <laughs> three hours of sleep a night every night and not have some medical issues. So he probably was chewing the coca leaf too and he's not telling anybody you know that would make much more sense yeah absolutely well i'm wondering i'm wondering derek do you have any um speaking of 4711 and um hohang club do you have any other colognes that you would recommend for people to try out this summer i do and, and uh balenciaga club is actually an eau de toilette uh so that's not a cologne it's a very heavy mm. i wouldn't say it's heavy it's not it's not an oriental fragrance but it's a very mossy, very mossy, herbal, lots of, uh, which is probably why they can never bring it back. It's lots of my source candle, yeah. lots of really redolent materials. Yeah. Not thick and rich, not musky per se, but I wouldn't call it a cologne. Oh, you can wear it in the heat. You, you can wear it in the heat, but it's not really, it's not really uh, going to be about the citrus as much as a cologne would be. Um, of course. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 4711 um it's weird because a lot of your narrowly based fragrances like your modern day modern day narrowly you know neroli portofino stuff like that uh bright neroli from ferrari etc cetera, etc cetera. even to an extent uh mugler cologne all of those fragrances base themselves off of the 4711 template they, they don't base themselves off the farina template so if you smell the Farina, the Farina Eau de Cologne, which the Roger and Goulet Extra VL is also based off the Farina formula too. So if you have access to the Roger and Goulet or the or the original Farina, they do not smell anywhere near as fully citric or fully bitter orange, fully herbal. The 4711 is a much lighter, starker mm. formula. And I feel that was the cheapening. That was how he got the price. He didn't put... He didn't put the base materials in the 4711 that the Johan Farina put in his cologne. So the whole thing of colognes not having a base, not lasting very long, that's only true if you follow the 4711 template. If you follow the original Farina template and all of its much smaller number of uh, you know progeny that followed, mostly everything followed the 4711 example. That actually has some uh, very tiny amount, of course, but it had a tiny amount of, I believe it was Tonkin and Civet hmm. in the original Farina. A very small amount, but it had some. So now it's white musks, of course, but still it's creamier. Yeah. So those fragrances and their descendants, fewer in number granted, are creamier. Castle Macy, actually, number six is another one that's kind of based off the Farina. So if you've smelled number six, or Roger and Galay, those colognes do have a bit more sillage. I mean, they're not going to go 10 hours, of course, but they'll get you like four or five hours. They will yeah. wear closer to a toilet, closer. Whereas the 4711 is gone in like 30 minutes because there's yeah. no base. And right. one more, just just a apologies for interrupting. Just to throw in one more would be uh, Cody's um, Cordon Rouge, which I agree because it has those those base notes, right? It has a little bit of civet, has a little bit of moss, and it, it and it is, I was so surprised when I smelled it. I said, "Whoa, what are these? This is supposed to be a cologne. What are these base notes doing there?" But but your distinction between these two kind of house styles and which yeah. one won, won out over history makes that completely explains it to me. So thank you. Yeah, I've never smelled the Cody because all, all of the uh, antique Cody's are kind of uh, unobtainium now. I mean, unless I have a rich friend who wants to throw samples at me, I'm not really going to get to smell them. But yeah, if it's based off the Farina model, it's going to have the musk in it. And uh, another one is actually a Dorsey fragrance. One of the earliest Dorsey's from like 1908, actually. It's called Etiquette Blue. And uh, I forget what it means. I think it means blue standard or something or blue 
blue jacket or whatever. Etiquette blue means blue article of clothing of some kind. And uh, the story behind that fragrance was supposedly the original Comte Alfred Axel Gimrod Dorsey or Count Dorsey, the inventor of the dandy style. If you want to go down a rabbit hole on fashion, <laughs> the inventor of the dandy ra- the the dandy clothing style with the hat and the uh, the sartorial and the cane and stuff, putting on the Ritz like Taco in the eighties. He was also a dabbled in perfumer, a dabbled in perfumery, and he created a narrowly based fragrance as well that had a bit of a heavier base. Feel like it was patterned after the Farina example once again. A little bit more bitter though because. Um, a little bit more bitter because it has some orris in it and it has some sandalwood, so it's more powdery, more bitter. It's not as rounded as Farina. But that fragrance, which <clears throat> was called Etiquette Blue, and then when the House of Dorsey formed in the early 20th century, they kind of approximated it because I don't think they had access to his formulae if they even existed by then. But they created, or rather recreated, according to their according to their their uh, history, they recreated Gimrod's uh, fragrance, uh, and then they made both a cologne version of it, which is just called Eau de Cologne d'Orsay, and then the heavier toilette version, which became Etiquette Blue. But those are also cologne options. I think it's discontinued, but there's still a lot of it out there in the wild if you want to smell it. But expect a more uh, powdery, sharp, and also a bit more uh, focus on the orange blossom than some of the other clone examples out there. It's really nice though. I like it. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah, I yeah. can't wait to track that down and and have a have a smell. Yeah, maybe a hundred buck at most. I mean, it could change, but that's about where it sits. And yeah, to, to answer your question earlier that I kind of steam, steam rolled over, clone recommendations, uh, yeah, beyond the uh, Roger and Galay example, Farina, 4711, uh, all the Guerlain colognes are basically just easy blind buys. Each perfumer of the Guerlain family had a different personalized take on the cologne style. The original one being Napoleon's cologne, of course, made by Pierre Pascal Guerlain. That one is going to be almost a bergamot solar floor because apparently the one thing Napoleon liked the most about the 4711 was the bergamot. So he wanted to dial back the narrowly and dial back the lemon, bring out the bergamot. But the consequence of doing so, bergamot is one of the most expensive citrus oils you can get, more expensive than lemon, all that stuff. It only comes from like a small part of Italy, right? At least back then. Back then it came from a small part of Italy. So that made the uh, Cologne du Imperial very luxurious because it was so much bergamot. And when you smell that, it's like a cup of Earl Grey tea. Like I tell people, if you like to drink twinings or whatever, and you want to smell like a cup of Earl Grey tea, get yourself some of that <laughs> Cologne du Imperial, spray that on and walk around and you'll, you'll just smell like Earl Grey tea for all of like 30 minutes. But <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. <clears throat> well, excellent. And then I, I brought out, I have this little miniature of um, Chanel's Eau de Cologne. They have an Eau de Cologne. I don't know if you've, uh, had the opportunity to smell this. It's very, um, you know, citrus forward, that kind of um, with a very light base. Um, yeah, very bergamot forward. It's some lemon on top, some bergamot. And yeah, very yeah, simple and classic. Farina yeah. example, it's got the creamy musks in the base, but it's a bit of a hybrid. It's kind of like Farina and Guerlain smashed together. Sort of the Guerlain bergamot and the Farina musk profile. I like it. It's just way over price for me. It's like 400, 400 freaking dollars. Yeah, no, you can definitely find uh, c- colognes just as equally as beautiful, but in a much more attainable. Because a lot of times people, they buy brand names like Chanel and Guerlain just to have the name of the bottle, right? To yeah. display. Uh, for sure, for sure. And then another one that I kind of brought out is, um, I'm sure you know Les Inde Modable, this brand. Um, and this is Escal on IET. Um, well, oh, I'll send you some samples. This is so cool. So this is um, kind of a, a a brand that's been around for a couple years and they're really focused on um, ethical sourcing of materials and using a lot of naturals um, in their fragrances and then also having more of a classical bent or classical style to the construction of mm-hmm. their of their fragrances and this is a cologne that has just um, a lot of vetiver in it so it's very much a, a vetiver based cologne which is I would you know, like that 
which is really fabulous. Um, so it has, you know, citrus on top and then lots of vetiver and then, you know, a really soft, um, a, a soft base, a um, little, little more woodsy than, than musky, but um, yeah, it's absolutely it's so refreshing. So, so fabulous. It's just soft and light for summer. Um, so it's definitely something I would recommend. And then this is a really cool house, um, Brava Naritz. And this is a lavender cologne. And the really cool thing about this is that the perfumer and the owner of this house, he uh, wild harvests um, mm -hmm. all of his, um, well, he, it's mixed media, but he wild harvests all of his natural materials. And he uses a lot of natural materials in his blend. And he actually is, as far as I know, the only perfumer to have ever done this. <laughs> um, he actually has worked, he lives in Spain. And he's worked with the the state, like the, the government of Spain, to come up with a wild harvesting protocols so that uh, no individual material from any area or region is ever over harvested. So to make sure that the supply chain is respected and... Um, you know, the ecology of the area is respected so that all all the plants, all the animals can continue in their natural habitat unaffected, which is amazing. And so I would recommend if you're interested in, in kind of that to go to his website and check it out. And um, his father grew lavender like on a, on a farm. And so he kind of grew up knowing the material very well. And this is just a really fabulous splash lavender cologne that is very ethical, you know, and I find that interesting too, just as a modern consumer. So those are kind of the ones that I pulled out <laughs> that I like and that I'll be wearing a lot this summer. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned lavender cologne because uh, lavender, the, the 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 advent really of lavender waters. That's what they were. That's what they were called originally. Uh, the advent of lavender waters was the first sign of the cologne becoming a concentration rather than a formula fragrance style to itself. So you know colognes for most of the 19th century after the popularization of 4711 and 3 and whatnot they all had to kind of smell like that with the narrowly the 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 citruses a little bit of maybe some herbs some basil or whatever in the base tarragon not not really any additional floral notes no rose nothing like that so lavender kind of became i mean lavender was around for centuries but lavender became fashionable in Victorian England. So suddenly like lavender was kind of the it thing for ladies, for men, for everyone. Again, gender wasn't as much of an issue back then. So suddenly you had all of these toiletry brands that had already existed, but like pre-existing. Uh, and the thing about the UK, the little spinoff is a lot of UK perfumery originates from uh, druggists, apothecaries. They, they, they didn't really have perfume houses like France was developing, Guerlain, Caron, stuff like that, Hubagon, you know, which those were all candle makers and stuff that kind of moved into perfumery. You know, the perfume from the UK, the big classic UK houses were all barbers, druggists. They had some other vocation first and perfume was like a side gig. And then the side gig, of course, classic story, the side gig overtakes the main vocation in time. So a lot of these uh, D.H. Harris, uh, GF Trumper, Penaligans, Atkinsons is another one, Yardleys is another one, you know, all of these old Floris. Floris was a dedicated perfumer. So there was one dedicated perfumer at the time, but the Crown Perfumery, another one, actually. Uh, and all of those began to kind of simultaneously throw out lavender waters, which were effectively colognes, just under another name. Nowadays, they're called what they are. They're called lavender colognes and whatnot, lavender eau de cologne. But you have a lot of Yardley's English lavender, Atkinson's English lavender, so on and so forth. And uh, that really, that lavender focus cologne then sort of opened the door wider. And then you saw other cologne types like the woody pine lemon colognes like Blood and Bouquet or Marlboro cologne from Jeff Trumpers. And then by the early 20th century, cologne no longer had any kind of meaning in terms of, yeah. well, it has to smell like narrowly, right? It has to be, no, cologne was just a concentration after mm. that, after that slow uh, diversification. But that lavender was really the, I guess, the fork in the road for that. You know, the lavender is what really kicked that off. <clears throat> oh, that's such, that's so fascinating. Again, 
thank you so much for all of this this fascinating history and all of these great breakdowns of fragrances. Um, and I'll ask this one last question before we wrap up. Um, if you were going to recommend one, so let's say perhaps more contemporary cologne um, for uh, our listeners to try out this summer, what would it be? Well, uh, I'm going to give you a couple because in recent decades, I'd say going back to about the 90s, uh, we've, we've seen what I like to call cologne plus, which basically it means someone taking the eau de cologne style and trying to up the concentration so you can wear it all day. You know, so it's, it's, it's a cologne style fragrance, but it's not cologne in terms of concentration. These, I feel like, are going to be more what modern noses want because modern noses don't want to carry around a giant liter bottle of 4711 and then just do this every like hour, right? <laughs> it's soaked and it's just not, not, it's not practical. So uh, I can't tell you which one started at first. I mean, I guess technically Etiquette Blue way back in the 20th century was one of the first stronger, but it was also a little different because of the powderiness. But in terms of more accurate to, to a 4711 or more accurate to a Farina, uh, Penalegans has one called Castile from 96 it's very nice uh if you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money mugler has mugler cologne which i mentioned earlier it smells like a lovely bar of french soap from a hotel um there is uh again a little higher price but the original house launching bond fragrance called eau de new york bond number nine i think that was 98 i think that came out but eau de new york is another fabulous one um parfum de nicolai has one called cologne salone that's one to, to check out another like amplified cologne. Um, and then of course, Neroli Portofino, which is the big one everyone knows, but that one's like, like I said, you're, you're buying that for the Tom Ford name. You're not really buying that for, for the smell at this point. But yeah, I would recommend those actually. Modern, longer lasting, you spray it on, you'll get eight hours out of it, you know, so. Absolutely, those are fantastic choices. Um, I would add only one to that list, and that would be a, a um, Christopher um, Christopher Chong is recently starting at Famine, and his one of his first releases is something called Fanfare, where he makes exactly the point that you're making. This is um, a cologne plus. It's a cologne that smells like a cologne, but it's going to last you eight hours, and it has lots and lots of citrus. It has some kind of gin juniper type, you know, mm. um, accents thrown in, and it's. Yeah, Cologne Plus that lasts all day. Um, oh, there's one more. Uh, Petit Matine by Maison Francis Curjon. Mm -hmm. Now, that's more of a linden blossom, so it's more of a mm -hmm. lime blossom fragrance, but it's still in the neighborhood. It doesn't deviate too far from the form. A lot of colognes deviate. Like Eau de Galan deviated too much. It had too much rose stuff going on. But So I don't want to name any of those, but Petit Matine is another one that's a pretty safe mm -hmm. bet if you're okay with the smell of linden blossom. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it sounds fat. I haven't tried that one, but now I will. It sounds absolutely fabulous. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining me today, Derek, and everyone. Check out um, Varanis, um, his Instagram, his YouTube. Uh, the details are below. Um, anything? Uh, do you want to, uh, if people are listening on the podcast, um, Derek, do you want to shout out your Instagram and YouTube addresses? Yeah. Uh, so I'm one of those nerds that has everything under the same name. So it's just Varanis, uh, V-A-R-A-N-I-S, and then an underscore, because this was from back in the day when we couldn't have spaces, right? So Varanis underscore Ridari, so V-A-R-A-N-I-S underscore uh, R-I-D-A-R-I, Varanis Ridari. That'll get you uh, my YouTube, that'll get you my Instagram, or also The Scented Devil. You can look that up too. Base notes, it's Varanus Radari. Uh, but the Scented Devil, it will be my WordPress and my uh, my Instagram. Varanus Radari will be everything else. Which, by the way, base notes, I'm going to plug base notes. You guys should really use base notes. Sign up for base notes. It's a very intimate, knowledgeable community. It's way better than some of the other sites that I, I'm not going to name. I'm not going to pick a fight and name names. But you know, if you know, you know. It's a much more, much more intimate, more knowledgeable site. Plus, they are independent. So if you decide you like base notes, you use it enough after you sign up, consider pledging your Patreon. Three bucks a month minimum. It's not very much. You can't buy a coffee for three bucks anymore. Three bucks a month removes ads, gives you all kinds of extra features. It's just worth checking out. Now, my, my reviews go there first. So 
you want to know where to get the drop on my reviews, base notes, man. That's where you want to be. And definitely check yeah. out uh, his reviews, uh, Varanis's reviews, Sent to Devil reviews, Derek's reviews. They, they're amazing reading. They're so intelligent. So um, just, I mean, they're brilliant, right? Intelligent, eloquent, accurate, incredible. So everyone um, follow all of his spaces and also follow SomSense, SomSense.com. I'm Rachel K. Ng on Instagram. And thank you so much for listening.